Hey there, everybody. Welcome to my booth. I'm Jay, if we haven't met yet. Naked Goals by Marco Cavazos. I just finished up recording it, and I loved, loved, loved working on this book. He terms it an absurdist, surrealist book, and it is such a fun, weird, absurd dreamlike ride through this narrator's experience. I won't get into it before we read the passage too much, but just a bit of context. Uh, he's been called to this hotel, invited to this gathering by the mysterious Mr. Delavan, him and a couple other of just random associates from the world. We never really find out what exactly they do, what their deal is, but they're invited to this hotel to have a meeting and the hotel is either designed by, for, about Andy Warhol, so it's really pop arty, uh, very heady. He gets into the, the things about it, but he's been invited. They're at this hotel. Let's dive in, and then we'll talk about it. Despite the view, it's breathtaking. If you forget about the floating bread, which must really stink up close, the welcome fruit basket I haven't touched yet. Apples, oranges, a mango, a jackfruit, a pomegranate, some mini bananas, a package of mixed nuts, the 24-hour personal doorman standing at attention, asshole but loyal, clean white sheets, new pillows, every luxury considered. You guessed it. I can't fucking sleep. And get this. My room has no bathroom, but Mr. Delavan has paid for everything, so shh. No bathroom in a suite. It's some sick art joke Warhol must have thought up in one of those pretentious benders with that creepy half-smile. When I have to go, I use the one in the lobby. Bladder full, lobby. Bowels full, lobby. Think the bladder might be full pretty soon and you want to sleep for a while? Lobby. And now that I'm thinking about it, lobby. This whole thing's killed my van life ambitions. F*** man. All those hours on YouTube for nothing. I guess the saving grace is that I got to figure it out now, vanlessly, rather than by driving around at 3 a.m. looking for a public bathroom, considering a bucket, and cursing my own damn self for poor life choices, masked as min minimalist naturalist ambition. Maybe I'm just getting older, maybe it's this stupid situation, but I find myself having to piss three times before bed every night. Once before I get in bed, again when I finish reading. I'm reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Kidding. Screw that entire genre. I'm reading Sartre's Nausea again. Maybe that's why I can't sleep. And for a third time, just after I start dozing. This wakes me up, and I end up drinking water to clear the sleep goo out of my mouth, which basically starts the routine all over. Only now, the fat front desk boy, Pudge Johnson, real name unknown, but probably something overly fancy to the point of being idiotic, I suspect Henry James William George Marshall Donovan III, has come up with this schedule for bathroom privileges, like I'm overindulging. The kid's got to be something like 15, and he's the boss. My 200-year-old doorman cowers around the kid. And me, I have to sneak by him just to use the bathroom. He's getting wise. He's on the lookout. I heard him whispering to my doorman something like, if he, bathroom, but I'm not worried about it. The doorman may be useless and an asshole, but goddamn, he's loyal. Loyal like a dog, though. Like, he's always there, happy to see me. He may not have an idea what's really going on. I twist the knob, the latch pops, echoing down the hall, and the doorman snaps his heels. Laundry, sir? No, thanks. I'm just... Room service, sir. No, thanks. I'm... Is something bothering you? Harassing phone calls? No, no, I... We've had a problem lately with harassing phone calls. If that's the issue, it's quite all right to tell me that we suspect a competing hotel between you and I, sir. No, no phone calls. I'm... It's quite all right for us to have secrets, you and I. That's why I filled you in on the harassing phone calls bit. Uh, we can agree to keep such intrigue quiet. He winks. What can I do for you, sir? Nothing, thank you. God. 
I'm in my complimentary cotton velour slippers matching sky blue robe. Why are you blocking me? I shove past. As much as I like him, he does need an elbow now and then, like some people might do with a dog. Not in a mean way, of course, in a training not to jump on me way. Ugh! Did he put you up to this? Pudge? Did he? That son of a bitch. Let me tell you something. If I ever get on Yelp, his name's gonna be all over that one star. Uh, up to what? Uh, I thought we were having a moment. Were we not in a moment? Just now? About the phone calls? I'm going now. I feel slow and heavy. I picture myself like Tony Soprano when he goes to the fridge for snacks in his pajamas. Am I allowed to say HBO characters' names? It's like the music sampling, right? I, I think I'm all right as long as I don't say something like Tony Soprano was staying in the room across from me with the Guma from season two and he said etc. That I can't do, unless that's fan fiction. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I feel like fat, hungry Tony, that's the point. My slippers drag against the blonde shag rug that runs the hall. It has hot pink walls, blonde accents, and disco ball-inspired fixtures. I pass by doors to lifeless, silver-painted rooms. I've seen the doors open, guarded by more statuesque doormen in similarly pink uniforms. Probably haunted, this place. The paint color is more aluminum foil than silver, but y you get the idea. Random candles light the hall, dripping wax to form wax stalagmites, doing a number on the carpet. All the light in the hotel is either natural or from a candle, reflected by disco balls. I find the candles un-Warhol, and frankly, I suspect the hotel is a forgery or some other kind of twisted art joke. Actually, it's a commentary on materialism. I get it, Warhol. We're paying, well, Mr. Delavan is paying the premium to stay all five star, and you're over there reminding us that luxury isn't everything, that we're supposed to take in and appreciate the flickering candles at night and the UV heating up our lounge chairs by day, the candlelit disco balls. All right, I'll give him that. They're cool. I pass the doorman, and each offers their services with a snapping of heels. Thank you. No, thank you. I'm fine. Thank you, I say. The vibe mellows in the elevator, where the call buttons are Campbell's soup cans. I take a minute, try to remember the soup for the lobby. Uh, cream of mushroom? But that takes me up. It's turkey noodle, that's right. And pepper pot is the smoker's garden. Pudge Johnson, working the desk with a look like he's been waiting for me, blocks my path with the shuffle step that accompanies the this way, sir, of a non-consensual, politically motivated van entry. Like when the CIA takes someone for a meeting or something. You get it? What? Sir? Why are you looking at me like that? I need to go. I try to pass. He steps back, angles to block me again. It's your third time today. We have other guests. Don't. Start with me, Pudge. How's that your business? Move. It's specifically my business. You've been three times today. He looks over his shoulder towards the front desk where the brass key hangs from a hook. The key itself dangles from a length of white cord tethered to a section of two-by-four, about a foot long, like they have at gas stations. I've personally taken ownership of this case. I don't have a bathroom in my room. This is a customer service problem. It's my first time today. Your job is to provide customer service. Look, I get it. You're an art hotel. It's all a statement. I get it. Something about consumerism or socialism or whatever, but I'm not playing along. Not when I'm paying for it. Your stay comes at the compliments of Mr. Delavan. Regardless, I'm a paying customer, Pudge. Mr. Delavan. God damn it, Pudge. I have you down at 202. He checks a pocket notebook. Then again at 527, making this your... Give me the key. I've been up all night. I want to sleep. How am I going to sleep when I've got a piss? All right, let's not turn this into a scene. Will you be long? We have other guests. He snaps three times through his white gloves at the skinny boy, Styx. Also not his real name, but his is probably something super normal. Sticks hesitantly steps away from some paperwork to bring the key. 
It's messy paperwork, and if I had to guess, completely useless. Pages to be organized, filed, and cabinet box just in case the man comes for a next-level audit and never looked at again. Can you limit yourself to three minutes? That's none of your business, I say. Sir, it's specifically my business. As I've said, I've made this my personal case. I reach for the key. Please, sir, allow me. He bows. The key clicks into the hole under a silver knob. Pudge stands aside, gesturing forward. Then he follows me in. I'm afraid it's specifically my business. And may I take your robe? Yes, thank you. I'll be a while. Maybe you can come back. So it's just such a joy to read this type of material. When the narrator's voice and the narrator themselves are so fleshed out in a world that is so counterweighted to their own disposition where this narrator he reads sort of like a more high strung um i guess that's not really gonna work but i was thinking he's like a a sort of lebowski-esque character where he's just thrown into this situation in that sense but he's very much more high strung he's not really a go with the flow kind of guy necessarily but he does at times but because the narration is such a stream of consciousness, it affords you so much flexibility in the way that you read things, and it's just really, really rewarding to perform. And then when you get to throw in other characters, like Pudge and the Doorman, and then the other characters that you meet in this book, they're all equally as colorful, equally as weird, uh, and it's just such a cool world that feels really lived in. At least it was for me when I was performing it. So that was just one of the great things about performing this. And it's really great too because these passages, they live almost in a specific color palette. Like it's a really hyper colorful palette. Uh, the world, like I imagine Pudge in this like purple suit that's really vibrant. And then the hotel, of course, was described as really gaudy and uh, colorful as well. And then it has these other chapters which pull away and enter almost a completely different uh, color palette or even maybe genre where they go from this really colorful to just like stark, desaturated and almost like film noir-esque. And it was just such a really cool experience. So if you want to check it out, uh, there's a link in the description to the book itself. And if you have any questions about this, anything else voiceover related, you're always welcome to hit me up down below, reach out on my website. And if you like this stuff and you find it helpful, you can help us out by clicking the buttons down there. Until the next one of these, be well, and I will see you there. Toodles.